If you think back, because I know a lot of you have been here for coming to the AGM for a lot of years, if you think back a decade uh, and how much we did not talk about climate change back then, even, even, even as close as maybe five years ago, and how the conversations have changed, uh, pretty excited about this, this uh, first morning session. It really is uh, something that we are going to have to be doing going forward, is putting that lens on climate change on virtually everything we do. So we have three different panels today that are going to take us through, the, through those steps of where opportunities are for farmers, for our members, and uh, we have a pretty good, exciting lineup of, of speakers for you. So um, as, as you know, as you can see by the agenda, finding uh, sustainable climate solutions is the, the theme of this uh, panel. And and uh, for those of you who, who didn't hear Mary, I am Keith Curry, and I'm first vice president here at CFA. So I will be, as you mentioned, your moderator for the, for the three panels coming up. And uh, those three panels uh, combine, uh, combine uh, some experts from right across the country. The first one is on on-farm solutions. Uh, that's something that I know we all are interested in knowing how we can take advantage ourselves uh, of opportunities. Uh, the second one's important about uh, on-farm measurement and protocol. So how do we do what we do and how do we understand what we have? And then uh, certainly public and private offset credits. Uh, uh, Mary and Todd and I had a very interesting conversation with ECCC just yesterday on, on a bunch of these subject matters. So uh, it's really pertinent to, to hear what these panel members say because it's leading into a lot of what we're going to be doing going forward as an organization. Um, we want to showcase on-farm solutions, as I mentioned, that will actually re reduce emissions. That's going to be a challenge. We know it is uh, on how we get to those uh, reduction in emissions. And we want to address, as I mentioned, how they're measured and how we capture them. So. Uh, just a, a few ground rules for our panelists. Uh, you'll each have three minutes to present, followed by a question and answer, sorry, eight minutes to present, followed by a question and answer period. Uh, for you, the audience, we will be asking you to bring questions to the microphone at the end of the panel session. So the three, or the two or the three uh, presenters will do their presentations, and then uh, as we get close to the end of the last presentation, make your way to the mic if, if you have a question. And uh, so be thinking, get your thinking caps on and, and ask those hard questions, because we got the right people up here answering them. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the first uh, panel speaker, oh, and I should also say that we are, uh, we have a, a, a incredible staff team here at CFA that have put together a jam-packed, exciting agenda. They're so good that they've got a lot of stuff on it. So we, we do have to keep on time. So uh, to the panelists in particular, I will be uh, watching the time very closely. So uh, as you get to the end of your eight minutes, we, we're, we're gonna have to cut you off because we do want to get some questions from you, the, you, the, the audience. So our first panel is on uh, on-farm solutions. Uh, we'll examine three solutions that are available, uh, are nearly available on the market in 2022. Uh, the panelists are going to address their value, the value that their solutions offer to you, the producer, and as well as any you know potential stumbling blocks or barriers that may be out there to a, actually adopting it on farm and, and put, putting them in place in your operations back home. So first up, we have Lyle Weeb, who is the co-founder uh, and the general manager of Triple Green Products. And uh, he's going to be followed, or sorry, Lyle's career includes more than 30 years of experience leading various companies to success. He's here today to discuss Triple Green's innovative biomass grain dryer, really interesting concept. It'll re it replaces propane with crop residue as a low emission source of grain fuel for drying. And certainly we all know what we've been going through with respect to carbon pricing and as it's related to grain drying. So this should be really interesting. So Lyle, um, I believe you'll be coming up on the screen. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. You have eight minutes. The floor is all yours. Well, thanks for inviting Triple Green product, uh, Products to be a part of uh, this event. Um, today, uh, I am going to be speaking about uh, our uh, BioDry Air Unit, um, which uh, is um, part of uh, our product line. We do have uh, several other product lines as well, but uh, today we're going to be focusing on the bio dry air system. What we do, Triple Green Products manufactures and installs industry leading equipment in the agriculture, institutional, municipal and commercial industrial sectors uh, with the focus being on biomass fuel, fueled uh, renewable energy solutions. Uh, one of our core products is the bio dry air grain drying system that utilizes various biomass materials as fuel for combustion to generate heat energy. Um, and they, biomass is a, 
is something that um, is new to some uh, and um, and not to others. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later here. Who we are, Triple Green Product Solutions are unique in that we have been the industry standard for a long lasting reliability, providing clean energy solutions and cost savings for over 20 years. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that our clients have reliable equipment and energy sources now and into the future. Triple Green Products is backed by a highly qualified and competent team. I'd like to think so anyway. Um, to remain our mission to remain North America's leading clean and e renewable energy provider by ma manufacturing, distributing the most reliable, efficient, and carbon neutral clean energy products on the market. We are committed to social responsibility, uh, providing cutting edge re renewable energy solutions that utilize uh, biomass fuels. Biomass energy explained. Um, it's a clean renewable energy. Uh, it's uh, an energy that can be fueled with agriculture waste or other organics, combusts cleanly, meets carbon emissions thresholds. Grain drying. Drying grain can be one of the most energy intensive operations on the farm. Significant cost to farm farming operations even before considering that swear word carbon tax. Here's one of our um, display units. Um, and when this picture was, or this photo was taken, uh, it was in operation. It was being fed uh, corn stover uh, through the incline auger that you see there. And you will note that uh, there is no gases present uh, coming out of the, uh, the round circular duct. Um, so we know um, how to uh, not only burn biomass, but burn it very, very cleanly, uh, meeting even the stringent um, uh, California emissions tests. Um, so we burn our gases because we burn at uh, a very hot 1800 degrees Fahrenheit with a dual combustion system. The solution, the solution is a state-of-the-art carbon neutral bio dry air system that utilizes solid biofuels to provide heat to a conventional grain dryer at a fraction of the current fossil fuel costs, even natural gas. Significantly reduced energy costs realized immediately netting increased profits and cost savings. Reduced carbon, uh, reduced carbon profile significantly with the bio dry air system, reaping greater benefits from a tax standpoint and garnering a reputation for a commitment to a greener environment. Implement without rebuilding their existing infrastructure. In other words, our system, the bio dry air, can hook up to any uh, conventional grain dryer, both um, cross flow or the tower systems. Bio dry air systems use biomass fuel combustion to generate renewable heat energy. Energy costs are currently a significant line item for many, for any enterprise and are going to continue to rise as fossil fuel choices become more volatile and controversial. And we've seen that in the recent past. Carbon impact, carbon tax, carbon regulations are current re realities. Sustainable biomass fuel heating is carbon neutral. The bio dry air has been used in industrial mining applications for over 10 years, drying various products. In other words, we took uh, what we knew um, and uh, was proven for over 10 years in the mining sector and brought it into, uh, into the grain drying um, application that you see today. The benefits of the TGP bio dry air, each model is turnkey and able to integrate with existing conventional grain dryers. Triple green product systems feature unique benefits exceeding all current emission uh, standards. Features include uh, high efficiency biomass combustion, uh, like I stated earlier, we have a dual combustion system within, within our product, um, compatible with existing grain dryers, all different types of grain dryers. We have one system, that's going in in, um, in Michigan 
that uh, requires three of our very largest units um, to uh, to feed. Uh, it's a, a very large uh, 100 million BTU system. Fully automated control with touchscreen monitor, and it can be controlled with a smartphone. Here's a here's a graph, a bar graph that uh, we did for a uh, Saskatchewan farm uh, based uh, um, on 9,100 acres and drying roughly uh, 560,000 bushels using our um, using the bio dry air. Um, here are some of the comparisons. On your far left of the screen, you'll see the, the bar graph um, that states uh, $216,000 would be uh, needed to, um, to dry uh, that amount of grain. Uh, just on the other side, it, with the yellow uh, bar graph, is the natural gas pricing. And below that is um, the biomass fuel. Um, so when you add these numbers up over 10 years, um, when you go across the, the bars, um, using propane in 10 years would cost uh, $2.4 million to dry that same amount of uh, bushels over the 10 year period. Uh, whereas our system would be um, just over $100,000 using biomass. Um, the, um, you know, so significant uh, um, savings uh, that uh, can be seen with, with the bio dry air using biomass. Um, so these, um, these numbers were taking, taken, um, the fossil fuel numbers, propane and natural gas numbers were taken uh, quite some time ago, um, uh, about 10 months ago. And uh, we all know that uh, what, uh, the uh, fuel costs have uh, done since then. So those numbers would be even greater if uh, the chart was done today. Here's a system that um, is hooked up in Southern Ontario. Uh, you can see the bio dry air in the small shed um, pointed out in the, in the photo. Um, it's uh, feeding the dryer right next to the uh, the install and uh, this farm uh, uses uh, wood pellets um, and he dumps them into the uh, into his grain leg and he feeds the fuel uh, into the hopper bottom bin found right beside the shed um, and that uh, hopper bottom bin is then used uh, we use a flex a four inch flex auger to feed the bio dry air unit so uh, very um, user friendly um, and uh, and compact as well. Here's the numbers on that same system, uh, based in southern Ontario. Like I said, 1,100 acres, uh, drying roughly a quarter million bushels of corn uh, with some significant moisture. Uh, he starts out um, uh, harvesting at 33% moisture and. Um, and then uh, slowly as the corn dries in the field, it definitely uh, uh, drops. Uh, so the lowest moisture that he was harvesting was 23%. So anywhere uh, from 33% moisture to 23%, and we're drying it down to 15.5% moisture. So again, uh, this system using propane to dry that uh, crop, um, would have been uh, $90,000 this past year. And uh, with the biomass, um, it could be anywhere from uh, just over you know, $2,000 to the wood pallets was $14,000. So the cost savings over the 10 years, uh, or, or the, when you add the 10 year uh, chart uh, up uh, using propane, it would be $1.2 million to dry uh, that same amount of bushels over the 10 year period with a 3% cost increase uh, over that 10 year period. And, and uh, with the uh, 
volatility of, of uh, fuels, uh, it's actually gone up far more than that since this graph was, um, was produced. So uh, over 10 years, $1.2 million um, to dry that same crop and using the most expensive biomass fuel that you can get, and that's wood pellets. Uh, the cost using wood pellets is 160,000 to do the same thing. So saving roughly $1.1 million over 10 year period. Here's an ROI um, based on the Saskatchewan uh, example. Um, and uh, if, you, if a person was to buy the, the BioDry Air, um, it would have a 1.7 years uh, using propane or ROI. And with natural gas, just uh, four and a half years uh, ROI. Uh, in 10 years from now, uh, the graph is there as well. So just over a year um, and the ROI would be, or the bio dry air would be paid for using the samples uh, that we just talked about. We have a, a dealer network that spans across coast to coast and we are ever increasing that so that um, farms can be assured that uh, there is service available and parts available. We, we tend to um, uh, partner with, um, with uh, those that uh, do sell conventional grain dryers so they know grain drying inside and out. So, so uh, Lyle, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt for a second and I can listen to you all day uh, tell us how we're going to save millions of dollars. That's my retirement fund. It's fantastic stuff, but uh, we, are, we are getting grossly over time here, so I'm just wondering if you could just wrap up quickly for us. I'm sorry. So the thing is just... Um, so to just wrap up, um, our system is carbon neutral. So, um, you know, that's a big uh, advantage and uh, um, it's environmentally friendly and uh, you can have uh, uh, reduced costs by 30 to 80 percent. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this, uh, this uh, conference. And I look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks very much, Lyle. Really appreciate that presentation. So obviously some uh, great opportunities for, for us in the grain drying world in particular. So uh, next up, we have Mike Kinderman. He's an inventor and, and head of R&D for the Clean Cow Project at DSM Nutritional Products. And Mike is a trained chemist with a background in molecular bi biology and is working to bring cutting edge technology to the animal nutrition sector. He's here to discuss the three NOP cattle feed, which offers a 30 to 80% reduction in methane per cow. So Mike, uh, take it away. And a reminder, yeah. you have eight minutes. Yeah, and I have some good news. I was planning uh, for three minutes, so hopefully I can catch up already <laughs> with the first speaker who run over time. I don't know if you hear me and if you see the screen. That's, that, these are the two questions, please tell me. Do you see the, the, the presentation? Yep, you're good to go. So I'm talking about uh, reducing meth emissions from, from agriculture. I'm talking about Bovea, that's the product name, the active ingredient is in there, 3 NOP. I would like to also first use the opportunity to thank uh, the, the province of Alberta or Canada in, in general for supporting us so much. The, the Canada was one of the first countries that, that supported us with uh, um, in trials and also financially in co-financing um, our trials. I'm also happy to see Karen Haugen Coursera here on, on the uh, um, panel because she was also helping us a lot in uh, running trials in Canada. And she was even leading the biggest trial ever conducted for methane reductive feed additives, which we did um, in, in uh, Lesbridge and also in uh, Chinook Fetus, finished in 2020, 15,000 heads on this trial. So I'm happy to present quickly what it is, Bovea. And as I said, I only have three slides, but I could, of course, talk endlessly on this project. Bovea is the product name. How do you remember it? Bovea is a combination of bovine and air. But we couldn't use the word air as it's written here because otherwise we would sound like an airline, which is legally not possible. So we had to do this little twist. And this is uh, our product name. This is how we present, you know, our, our development. Cows make methane. It's not their fault. Um, so you have microorganisms in the rumen that help digest uh, the feeds of the animal. 
And these microorganisms, they're producing a waste product that's hydrogen and CO2. And there's a specific set of microorganisms, the so-called methane. They take up these waste products and turn it through a complex cascade of enzymatic transformation into methane, which is then worked out. Um, methane is a strong greenhouse gas contributing a lot to climate change and global warming. <coughs> and one of the big things that came out of the Climate Conference COP26 last year in, uh, in Glasgow was the recognition that, that methane methods and over 100 countries have signed up to the Global Methane Pledge, saying we need to reduce or setting themselves a target to reduce methane by 30% until 2030. When we think about this, uh, this rumen fermentation process, these methanogens that take up hydrogen and CO2 and convert it into this cascade of enzymatic transformation in, in methane, when we started to develop a uh, feed additive that reduces methane emission, we looked specifically into the microbiology of these methanogens and into these several steps of producing methane. And we developed feed additives that specifically inhibiting the last step of this enzymatic cascade. Why this last step? Because this is very specific to the methanogens and doesn't appear anywhere else in the cow. And therefore, we also wanted to exclude any unwanted side effects. Um, so when, when you ask, us how much Bovea do I need for dairy cow or beef cattle? It depends a bit on, on, on the feeding system, but the technical answer is in general 1 to 1.5 grams of the active ingredient. We translated this into a more simple picture and we said a quarter of a teaspoon of Bovea mixed in the dairy feed of in the daily feed of an animal is reducing methane immediately and brings it down to this target level 30. We have now published uh, um, data between 30 and 90 percent, and specifically in the in the beef sector, we see um, I mean the finishing diet a higher percentage of methane reduction. For us, it's important to let you know that the effect is immediate, so you don't have to wait for several days or weeks until you see the effect. It's precisely speaking within 30 minutes, so it's very fast and it uh, lasts very long. As long as you feed uh, bovea, the methane level stays reduced. We have proven the safety for consumer and for the animal and for the environment. And I don't know if that has already been spread here. Last week on Wednesday, we were caught by a nice surprise because we learned that uh, the EU Commission has given market approval for Bovea in Europe. And uh, that was, of course, a great milestone. We have also market approval in Brazil and in Chile and other regions will follow. So that's very good. And the question how it works is shown down here, and I explained it already, we are addressing one specific enzymatic step in this, in this uh, methanogens. And this is already my last slide. We were saying, how can we translate this into you know, more tangible pictures? What does it mean, um, a 30% methane reduction? And if we uh, take into account that the average um, that, that, that the dairy cow produces on average three tons of uh, CO2 equivalents as methane over a year, and the beef cattle was a little bit less. We say as a rule of thumb, um, with our technology with Bovea, we are taking one ton of CO2 equivalents out as, uh, as emission reduction. And therefore, I'm just focusing here on the middle picture. Um, another way of looking at it is if we feed Bovea to three animals, that's the equivalent of taking a family-sized car off the road. So the entire development until market approval has uh, taken 12 years. That's when you benchmark it, not so bad, right? And we are really happy that we can now make this sustainability the central purpose of our innovation. And we are also very happy to enable farmers to make a big difference in our global effort against climate change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike, and uh, certainly for our livestock producers, our, our cattle producers in the audience, uh, this is this is important stuff. And uh, who knows if we'd only had this during Buttergate, maybe things would have turned out better. But uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, so thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, our final presenter is uh, our. Um, 
For the first panel is Chris Cook. He's the head of Energen at Syngenta. Chris has been with Syngenta for 23 years and has held roles in agronomy, in stewardship, and in stakeholder relations. He's presenting on Energen, Energen corn feed, which reduces the environmental footprint of both dairy and beef livestock production, as well as feed costs by increasing feed efficiency. Chris, uh, again, the floor is yours, and just a reminder, you have eight minutes. Well, thanks, Keith, and you may have already summed it up for me, so we may be good to go with just the picture. Um, I apologize, first off, I can't be there in person. I'm stuck in a hotel room in Omaha, Nebraska, but I am from Minnesota, so it's like visiting neighbors right now, so thank you for being part of the conference. Um, you know, the question probably on your on your mind right away is, you know, what the heck is Anagen? Um, Anagen is essentially a corn trait technology. Um, so you think about corn that you plant today, say an NK corn hybrid, and uh, it's probably going to come with some rootworm technology, some corn borer technology, um, potentially glyphosate technology, things like that. And what we've done with Anagen is we've just added this in as another technology. So imagine your standard NK hybrid and you say we want Anagen with that. We put that in there and now we have an energy energy hybrid. So it's the exact same hybrids that you'd have in the marketplace today with just an additional trait. The trait antigen is actually alpha amylase. And if you think, well, that's really neat that it's corn, but what the heck is alpha amylase? Um, alpha amylase is really simply, a, it's an enzyme that converts starch into sugar. Um, so when you take a break later and you're walking past some chips or some cookies or things like that, thinking, yeah, I wouldn't mind a snack. Um, as you eat that potato chip or maybe some fries at lunch or something like that, um, alpha amylase is actually in your saliva. And that alpha amylase is what breaks that starch down into sugar and the sugar, of course, is energy. So essentially, that's what we've done is taken this enzyme, been able to put it into corn. And that's what really drives um, the benefits that we see here with energy. So, so, you know, if you think about a dairy cow or you think about, uh, you know, a beef cow, um, what do they eat? I mean, primarily they're eating a lot of corn. That's, that's just the way it works. Corn is their primary energy source. Corn is about 75% starch. Um, antigen, like we talked about, has this alpha amylase technology in it. Um, that technology is, I mean, alpha amylase is the best thing out there converting starch into sugar. Um, in antigen, um, in antigen hybrids, I mean, it just flat out does it better than anything else in the marketplace. Um, what that looks like, if you think about the bottom of the screen here, um, as we've done studies at, say, uh, Kansas State University, University of Nebraska, uh, Penn State, Ohio State, uh, the Minor Institute up at Cornell, um, University of Wisconsin, different universities across the U.S., um, or even look at, you know, the on-farm experiences that we've had, it just comes out to 5%. I mean, it, you might have a little bit above, a little bit below, but if you think about sometimes we talk about there's a wide variation in the numbers. It's a really tight number. I mean, 5% is pretty consistent everywhere we go with all the trials that we do. Um, it's consistent in whatever way you feed it, um, whether you're looking at, uh, say, silage in a dairy cow ration or even a beef cow ration. Um, you're thinking about dry rolled corn, um, whole corn. Um, we've even seen it in steam flake corn when you get down into the southwest U.S. where they do a lot of that. And I think that's a highly efficient process. Um, even in that process, we continue to see that 5% efficiency. So certainly, you know, what that can mean to you is, is obviously you're going to pick up some, some energy gains. Um, you're going to pick up some lower costs if you're thinking about less feed. Um, a question that always pops up is, hey, what about acidosis or bloat is another thing. It, you know, it seems like this is maybe a little bit more intense feed. Um, it really doesn't affect that. And the reason it doesn't affect that is, is the impact of antigen really doesn't take place in the rumen. It actually takes place post-ruminal. Um, so later in the digestive tract. And because of that, we don't see the, the bloat or the acidosis that you'd hear about. Um, so, so there really are some great benefits. Again, it's, it's just a corn hybrid and it's just replacing that. I've got uh, a good friend that heads up our, our sustainable and responsible business. And she often says to me, as we talk about sustainability, you know, it's not about changing everything, right? It's about if you can change just one thing. Um, Bovaire is a great example. Hey, you know what? I could do this and it would, you know, it'd make a real impact on what we're doing. This is another one simple thing you can do. I can, instead of planting this hybrid, I'm going to plant this hybrid. All the management practices, everything is still the same. I'm just going to do this one thing different. 
And that makes a real impact. And then as you think about, you know, maybe next year or two years from now, I want to do one more thing, uh, maybe some cover crops or something like that. And that's going to take me to another level as well. It's all about these incremental step changes that we do that can really have an impact. So, uh, you know, Mike really had some great information that he shared on the impact that it can have. I'll share both uh, beef and dairy. We'll start with dairy. Um, if you were to replace uh, the corn ration that you're using today with Enogen as your corn ration um, on a thousand lactating cows, uh, and I always think of these as Ferraris, right? I mean, they, this is what they do. They produce milk. They're fantastic animals. It really has a big impact. And I, I loved his example with the car. Um, here's what we see on a thousand on a thousand lactating cows. It takes 314 cars off the road. Um, you think about needing less feed to get the same production. And it's 189 less uh, football fields or uh, 21 less Olympic swimming pools, 19 homes. I mean, it, it's a huge impact as you think, particularly on the, on the Ferraris, if you will, of dairy cows. As you look at beef production, it's still extremely impactful. The difference here between the Ferrari is this is a little bit more like uh, probably the F-150 that I drive. Um, because you're really looking at it, you know, when you take them away from mom and you're, you're really at that backgrounding stage all the way to the feeder stage. Um, and corn is, is not as impactful in silage and those parts of it. Um, it's still a huge impact. Um, 35 cars on a thousand head is that's a huge number. And again, you see the, you know, the land equivalent use a little bit higher, um, energy for the houses a little bit higher water is pretty close. I mean, it really, really can make a big difference. And again, it, you know, you tie it all the way back around, to look, this is just one change. Um, Bovair is another change. You know, what Lyle was talking about with triple green products, it's another change you can make and just do one simple thing that can really have an impact on your operation and an impact on everything that we're doing as well. So, so I hope I saved a little bit of time, Keith. I will stop there and uh, open it up for questions for all of us. Great, thanks, Chris, and thanks for being uh, concise and to the point. So now it's your turn. Uh, certainly a lot of good information in the, in the th three panels presented. So if you have a question, we have two microphones in the middle aisle here in the room. So uh, by all means, uh, line up for those questions. Uh, we have some excellent representation here. Uh, just an interesting point. I know that uh, m when we talked to Mike last week, I believe he was in Switzerland. I think today he's in Africa somewhere, if memory serves me correct. So uh, we have people from all, literally from all over the world here today. So um, if you have any questions, as I mentioned, jump up to the microphone. And uh, but please also respect the social dis distancing uh, as you do line up. Um, you know, I know uh, Lyle, you did have some uh, numbers on return on investment uh, on your presentation and over a period of time. But really, you know, for those of us that are producers, that is really key to us that economic aspect. So for each of you, I'm wondering if you can give us some kind of a an idea on timeline on a return on investment. And I realize every operation is different, but is there is there a general thought on on the, sort of the payback time uh, if they invest in in these types of technologies or these programs that that each of you have? So maybe Lyle, if you want to start off, we'll go to go to Mike and then to Chris. Lyle, you're on mute. So you win a prize. You win a prize uh, for having to say that the first time, yeah. <laughs> Today, so far. Um, so, so good question. Um, the ROI um, in any farming operation uh, is is very important, and um, uh, that's sort of a moving target. But um, just the samples that we used today. Uh, you can see um, our return on investment is anywhere from two years to five years, uh, depending on the fuels um, that uh, you're going to uh, replace uh, propane or natural gas with. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Mike? So from our perspective, um, it depends a bit on the region where you apply this, this technology. And we are also seeing that we need to refine the business model away from the classical business model that we had in the past, that also needs in for the feed additives, because here we are tackling this carbon emission um, reduction, uh, greenhouse gas emission, and this is picking up now also in the value chain, not only feed mill and farmers, but what we see is from the other end, from the consumer retailer back to the processes, the pressure is also increasing in terms of uh, we need to do something, and therefore, we are currently exploring the business models, but um, there are a lot of things moving in the right direction. Great, 
And Chris? Yeah, Keith, I mean, it's it's immediate. There is no upcharge, if you will, to using an engine hybrid versus a traditional, say, an NK hybrid or any other brand of hybrid. So uh, just making that change is simple. Um, the ROI is immediate. We, you know, there, there could be potential benefits farther down the road. We're doing some work with folks like the Nature Conservancy and other folks on how can we plug it into, you know, entire value chains. And would that create a, you know, a draw on the end, say, with, uh, you know, a large consumer products good company that says, you know, we're willing to pay a little bit more to pull that through our system because it helps in, in some of the same targets that we have. Um, but, you know, right now it's, look, that 5% efficiency is right there day one. Excellent. And we do have a question from the audience, but just before we get it, and maybe you can address it in supplemental uh, answers, but we also have to measure the cost of not doing something uh, and what, what is the cost of that. And we all know certainly uh, when it comes to grain drying, uh, that's, a big, that's a big burden on our, on our grain producers, that, that tax on carbon. So efficiency there is really important. And, you know, the, the social environmental pressures that our livestock producers are under, uh, the cost of not doing something is almost as big as, the, as what the return on investment is so uh, if you have comments on that later we'd, we'd uh, be welcome to hear him but I'm gonna go to Todd Lewis he's gonna he's got has a question for you uh, question yeah good morning everybody it's a very good panel and uh, question for Lyle your unit uh, you know in grain drying that's something that, that can only be used you know for a very specific time you know during the growing season are your units able to be adapted to uh, other applications like uh, to provide uh, heat for a boiler system or things like that have you done any work on that on that kind of a, of, a, of a different application for, for that technology? So good question. Um, and we get asked that uh, quite often. And the answer is yes, but, um, you know, on a 20 million BTU grain dryer, uh, our system is, is um, uh, you know, built to match that size of grain dryer. And uh, when, when, uh, when most farmers are looking to heat, um, uh, you know, a shop or some other buildings, it takes just a very much of a fraction of that amount of BTU. So economically, a person is better off just buying a small biomass uh, boiler system, which we sell as well. Uh, it's going to be a better return on investment to run just that small boiler system to do those other, uh, uh, you know, requirements. Excellent. Thanks, Lyle. So we have one more question from the audience. We are getting tight on time, but Jen, go ahead and ask a question. This should be a quick one. Thank you. Those were all very great presentations. I have a question uh, regarding the Syngenta product, and is that strictly for livestock, or is this something where, um, for example, biodiesel, or sorry, ethanol or uh, starch production for food grade, would that be something that would improve the efficiency of those processes so that it could be part of the grain market? Well, the, the quick answer is yes and no. Um, that said, it was actually originally developed for biofuels, and we do use it in the biofuel sector, so it's been on the marketplace and approved since, I think, 2010 in Canada and 2011 in the U.S. Um, related to biofuels. Um, that said, um, using it in uh, food processes, the challenge there, and, and, and it's approved for food and feed use as well, but using it in a food process, generally what they want is they want to hold that starch together. Um, that's where we really see that, right? M&Ms, you don't want them to melt in your, in your hands, right? They're supposed to melt in your mouth. Well, that enzyme breaks that starch down so well that um, it can have an impact in that process. So that's why we, we actually have a voluntary stewardship program that we adhere to within Syngenta. We audit it. We, we contract every field. We, uh, we map every field. We don't ship anything without it being contracted because of the fact that we want to make sure that we keep um, antigen channeled to the places that we want it, which is either, either in biofuels or in the feed market. It's a great question. And Ron, give me the Spocky and I. So Ron Maynard has a quick question to, f to finish up. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's a question from Mark on your uh, product. You mentioned two, two questions, I guess, quickly. Uh, you mentioned about a 30% reduction, but you also said you had research, if I, if I heard it correctly, that says from 30 to 90% reduction in methane. What seems to be the variance? That's a huge variance between uh, 30 and 90, of course. Uh, any comment on that? Uh, the second part of my question would be, uh, the manure that's produced by, and I'm thinking about this with biodigesters, the manure that's produced by these cows that are fed your product, uh, what is, the, is there an application or a reduction in uh, uh, gas production uh, if you were to put that manure into a methane by, uh, anaerobic digester? Thank you. 
Thank you for both questions. So the variability, it's, it's not really a variability as, as we understand it from the word. We had to learn, you know, how diets and uh, the, the feed composition and the dosage of Bovair is uh, connecting to each other. And sometimes we had really surprising, positive um, um, surprises. Keeping the same dose of Bovair in one feeding system or another gave different results. And the main reason is that methane production is driven by the methanogens, by the microorganisms, and the population, the activity is driven by the feed that the animals eat. So now we have a, a large data set at our hand and we are publishing at the moment a paper with an algorithm when, where we say, if we know the feed ingredients, you know, the feed composition, and if we know the dose of purveyor, then we can exactly predict what's the effect of uh, methane reduction. So it's not a variability where, where you have no clue. It's quite the opposite. We understand now this interplay and therefore we, we, we can predict it quite precisely. The second question was um, on, on manure. Also here, the main studies on manure and, and the effects has been done in Canada. Also great support from here, AFC. So we know the mode of action of Bovea precisely. It's get, getting bro broken down in the rumen by its own mode of action. And that's, that means that you don't find any traces of Bovea in the, in the manure. And that also means, and that has been published in three different publications, the quality and, 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 um, and quantities of manure stays unchanged. So there is no worry, you don't find it in manure or you don't find it in the excreta and the quality of manure and the properties, they stay unchanged. Great, fantastic. Thanks. Thank you to all three of you. Excellent presentations and Q&A and, and certainly from a CFA perspective, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing to work with folks like you going forward because these new types of technologies is how we're going to get into the climate change game and 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 the same uh, in the same time make it really economically viable for us back on the farm. So so thanks very much for those uh, those presentations. We appreciate it very thank much. Thank you all. Thank you. So our next presentation is actually on on-farm measurement uh, and, and protocols, and we're going to discuss you know the different approaches to qualifying that carbon sequestration. That's always the big question: is is how do we do that? How do we get predictive modeling and outcome-based measurements? Panelists will address the distinct merits and the features of these methods, as well as uh, areas of overlap. The goal is to dig into how carbon sequestration can be best qualified to help producers generate carbon credits. Our first presenter is uh, probably no stranger to a lot of you in the room, or maybe even most of you in the room. She's been at this game a long time, Karen hogan Casera, who is president of Fresco uh, Solutions. Karen, she, as I mentioned, she has over 30 years of experience in agriculture, greenhouse gas measurement, and in modeling. Uh, and then she's developed uh, and developed carbon offset protocols for Alberta, for Quebec, for Ontario, and for California. So she's going to present on Varesco Solutions, uh, the work that they've done predicting uh, on predictive modeling to qualify that soil carbon sequestration. So Karen, uh, if you're ready to go, uh, take it away. And again, you have eight minutes. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, good day, everybody. Uh, appreciate being invited. Apologies on two fronts. One, that I couldn't be there in person. Would have been great. And number two, I did not get this translated beforehand. But thank you to the organizers for allowing me to still present, and it will be translated after the, uh, after the conference. So, so who are we? Uh, we work with all sorts of entities and partners and clients in deploying climate smart solutions and nature-based solutions along the agricultural supply chain, but there's governments we work with, NGOs, all sorts of, of entities um, from any part of the sustainability journey that these entities are on. Um, we have a team of experts that we work with. We're very proud to have some soil scientists. We have four soil scientists on our team. Um, Dr. Brian McConkey, 33 years at Ag Canada, joined us about three years ago now. Um, and so we have bench strength uh, when it comes to assessing and measuring um, soil organic carbon. The key takeaways I'd like to leave you with right off the bat are that direct measurements of soil organic carbon underpin all other methods of estimating soil organic carbon change. And so the tried and true method of taking a soil core, 
Um, whether we're now going towards modeling or remote sensing, or you still need to have the validation in the beginning, at least, um, for direct measurement. And in terms of offset systems, because I think the focus is on markets, uh, process models appear to be the most suitable for offset systems, and I'll describe why that is. Um, and then the level of accuracy, this is where we're all struggling right now with the market requirements, whether they're voluntary markets or compliance-based markets. Um, you know, for biological systems, they're not metered. And so this the degree of accuracy required and uncertainty by these markets is a real challenge. And um, thanks, Keith, for, for talking about all the work that we do everywhere. So, so there are three types of markets and some of your subsequent speakers will get into more detail around here, but we have the compliance or regulated one. I come to you from Alberta where it's been 15 years of carbon pricing um, and a story there for soil organic carbon that you won't see anywhere else in the world. It's been a struggle. Um, there's voluntary carbon markets. Um, the three that I mentioned here are sort of the high quality, high ranked ones. And then there's the supply chain uh, markets where uh, companies, and I think Mike was alluding to it, uh, are investing within their inventory and their supply chain to bring about solutions on the ground. But this one is under development and under construction. So just a, a word of warning that this is all sort of in a, in a state of, of development. In the world, outside of Alberta, there has been very little uptake on experience of agriculture and carbon markets. In the American Carbon Registry, 0.2% of the tons that have been brought about since 1996 are in agriculture. Gold standard stood up by WWF in 2003. Again, 0.2% agriculture. The verified carbon standard, 0.2% in agriculture, a lot in forestry, a lot in, in renewable energy. And then the California Climate Action Reserve, another voluntary market, which does have the uh, uh, the Canadian grasslands protocol that we brought through, um, it has an order of magnitude more, but mostly grasslands. So there has not been a lot of experience with agricultural carbon in outside of Alberta, where we have 17 megatons of CO2e that have been generated over time. The challenges with soil carbon offsets in these markets, there's policy challenges. I'm sure many of your delegates have heard that nasty word additionality. Um, we need to deal with it. Uh, permanence of stored carbon expectation now aligned globally is 100 years, and there must be reversal of monitoring and replacement if there is a reversal of soil organic carbon, because that's a fungible unit now globally aligning on uh, the transfer of units between countries since uh, Glasgow, aggregating projects at scale. So we have to have protocols that work for aggregating projects. The scientific challenges is there sufficient data across time and space to detect that change um, and calibrating and validating models? Do we have enough scientific data of practice change baseline to project activities to be able to calibrate and validate models? And then the technical challenges, soil stratification and sampling, and then applying those models. So that has been the past challenges. Many of those voluntary markets have had methodologies and protocols available since 2010, but they haven't been implementable. So one thing I wanna leave you with, if anything else, is that soil organic carbon stocks, like a point in time soil carbon map, doesn't tell you anything about change. We need to understand the change over time. And the high signal to noise ratio is a real challenge with a high background carbon detecting the change over time, it could be two orders of magnitude less. So that's challenging given the uncertainty requirements that these markets have. So if we take a look at where we have quantification of soil carbon, there are with the 2019 update, there are default factors, but there are some challenges with applying the default factors. Most markets don't approve of that. In Alberta, pre-model default factors. So the conservation cropping protocol used the national emissions inventory methodology and it was coefficient based. So you weren't putting the burden on the project developer to do all the modeling and all the soil sampling. Climate Action Reserve and its two most recent iterations of grasslands and nitrogen management are following Alberta. These scale well. Direct measurement 
it is, it's got exceedingly difficult things. Um, there's been a protocol in Australia since 2015, hasn't been implemented. A new one in Vera, everybody's trying to figure out how to do that, global coverage. Project level modeling, Nori and Quantified Ventures, sort of startup marketplaces in the US are using Comet Farm. So no soil sampling per se. Um, hybrid measurement modeling seems to be the more uh, progressive types of protocols, Climate Action Reserve, Vera, Gold Standard, very recent ones, Indigo Ag brought the soil management protocols through those. So that gives you an idea of the struggle, I think, of where we have been and where we want to go. There's also the challenges around estimating soil organic carbon at a point. So you've got direct measurement or you're using a series of proxies that are trying to determine without destructive sampling. Um, what is that soil organic carbon concentration? We still need bulk density and we need to be able to detect the change over time. And so that these are some of the challenges with that, that high, you know, sticks, high noise to signal ratio. And then how do we take that point and how do we scale it up over an area? That's a bit of a science all in and of itself. But we've seen an explosion of innovation. Um, and you're going to hear from Karn from Terramera after me. Um, and there is so much being driven in how do we crack the nut to get something that's going to be more of a rapid assessment of soil organic carbon, realizing that at the end of the day, it is underpinned by measurement, at least to validate these things. So the big question that I want to leave you with, too, is this required accuracy by these markets. And so that's becoming such a challenge right now in trying to bring forward new soil organic carbon protocols. Um, and so that this, the challenges around soil bulk density and the uncertainty, which, you know, in the academic world, think of the probability of how close you are to the mean. Sometimes these things are 15% variability with a 95% confidence interval. That's the highest bar. It is hard to get. 15% variability in soil organic carbon measurement when you're taking samples in the ground. And then the there's deductions. So you've got, if you can't get to that accuracy level or that uncertainty level, you are going to be discounted. And so that's a real challenge because the small amount that's, you know, the yield per carbon per acre, you don't want to have discounting. And many of these protocols have compounded uncertainty. So in our view, the path forward is really about Getting those models well calibrated, don't put the burden of all the sampling onto the project developer to validate or calibrate or parameterize the model. And if at all possible, you'll hear from Judy Metzger later around a soil um, enhanced soil carbon protocol that's coming forward with Environment Canada Climate Change. Um, if you can do that modeling, that pre-modeling, and allow the market to really do what it does best is scale and aggregate and use those coefficient based by region. That's the way to do it. That's the way Alberta had done it. And so it's really important that we, we think about how to develop a protocol that fits with the market requirements. And going back in time, if you do a bad job of sampling in the beginning, you can't go backwards. Models allow you to recalibrate them and move forward. So what uh, we're really promoting is to have Sentinel sites set up across the country where we're able to get that high quality sampling and generate soil organic carbon data sets for users to use to be able to move forward with soil organic carbon models that are part of a, a whole system of prediction. And this, you know, Australia is investing in this. Soil carbon is one of their four pillars in their technology strategy. And so, you know, if, if Canada could, could do the same and be able to move forward with uh, robust data sets for calibrating and um, assessing the way to model and allow all sorts of entities with all sorts of proxy measurements to use this data, I think that's going to be the best, the best approach forward. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. A lot of information packed in a short time, and I know from a from an organizational lobby perspective, what really jumped off uh, one of your slides for me was the potential of policy formulation without sufficient data, and it seems to be a, a reoccurring, ongoing theme. So uh, that the great, great, great presentation. 
<clears throat> so next up, as Karen mentioned, uh, we have Karen Manhas from, uh, he's the CEO of Terra Mera, and certainly the CFA has had a lot of interaction with Terra Mera over the last couple of years, but his company is in the process of commercializing scalable, accurate, and low-cost remote sensing technology to reliably measure carbon content in the soil, and he's going to present on that technology for you today, and we're happy that he's here in person. So Karen, the floor is yours. Everyone, um, I think they put Karen and me on so that we could have two people that, where you can get our, our names confused. Um, uh, first of all, it's great. Uh, Karen, I was hoping to, to see you in person. I'm, I'm hoping that's uh, very, very soon now. Um, I uh, just want to first of all start, I am going to be talking to you about carbon um, and, uh, and, and in the context of soil health. It's, it's great to see some of the, the, the uh, innovations in the last panel to reduce the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere, but carbon is also not just a, uh, a dirty word. I actually just wrote an article which may be uh, useful for you. I don't mean it as a, a shameless plug, but it actually does really make the case how important carbon is in agriculture. Um, and it's actually called Carbon is Not a Dirty Word on AgFunder, and I encourage you to take a short read. Um, so, Karen mentioned the, uh, the, the importance of, of, of carbon to carbon markets. What I really want to drive home is how important carbon is to your business um, and economically. I, I would like for, for you to be thinking about carbon not just as uh, uh, a, a solution to climate change, but important economically for your uh, for, for your profits and, and, and for your business. So I'm just going to start off uh, just a, a, a quick introduction to Terra Mera. We're a 12-year-old uh, agricultural technology company based in uh, Vancouver, uh, 120 people uh, from 35 countries. Um, and our focus is really how to use machine learning and AI to understand chemistry much more much better. We have two areas of business. One is called green chemistry, where we, we work with producers of uh, manufacturers of, of uh, agricultural inputs to digitally look at how they uh, produce their, their, their products and increase the absorption and efficiency of their, the products that are, are being used um, and sold on farm. And the second area of business is what we call intelligent agriculture. And um, you'll hear more about this. This is very much focused on quantifying uh, and mobilizing uh, soil health. So uh, we have, so why is that, why is that important? Um, so our focus is on, on, on soil health because the, the more we enrich soils with carbon, the more it drives economic value and the more it drives um, solutions for, uh, that are sustainable for the planet. The first one uh, on, on the left is because as we drive carbon into the soil, if you think about rich soil, it's black, it's black because it's, car it's full of carbon. Um, that, that soil um, has a, 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 you know, uh, a rich soil structure that, that uh, holds water much better. Um, and as we're talking about issues of drought um, and flooding, um, carbon is actually the material that actually is going to hold more water into, into our soil. So it is important not just at, for mitigating climate, but also as we see more changes to climate, we need to think about how we drive more carbon into the soil so that we have farms that are more resilient to the changes that are going to increasingly come in the years ahead. There's a lot of benefits to this, not only to in, in, in as a uh, solution to climate change, but uh, uh, because it produces cleaner water, more nutritious food, um, higher nutritional density. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm going to keep on coming back down to, to, to profits. That's a lot of what we're focusing, we will be focusing on more and more, is helping to make that connection between processes that actually drive carbon into the soil and drive soil health and what that actually means to farmer profit. A lot of focus over decades has been on driving yield, but an extra pound of nitrogen may drive more yield um, on the acre, 
but it may not drive more profit. And so the, the, the thing that I want, we, we want to really make the connection on is how do we help producers think about the profit? Um, and focusing on carbon uh, is, is really one of those. So carbon credits, you're gonna, we're, we're going to hear more about those in, in the years ahead. Karen's really the expert here on, on carbon credits. Uh-oh, my slides don't match. Um, uh, carbon credits um, are just a small part of the economic value created for farmers. So um, if you're looking at 20 to $25 uh, in carbon credits, producers will probably end up with somewhere between $5 to $15 of, of, of that credit after all of the costs of administrating that. But as we increase carbon into the soil, this is one study, there's, there's been three in this particular study from uh, Ohio Ecological Society. This was on corn, we found that Increasing carbon into the soil in, car in, in corn produced up to $100 or more per acre in profit. Now you're talking about, I mean, those are huge numbers. That means the profit level went up multiple times uh, what the producer was getting uh, prior to that. So I keep on wanting to underline this. This is important economically uh, for producers. The process of, of driving carbon in, into soil is, is, is simple. I'm not going to go into this. It's really photosynthesis. Plants take carbon out of the atmosphere with sunlight, turn into sugars for, for their metabolism, and they push the extra carbon down into the soil. So how do we get more carbon into the soil? Well, there, the, the first step is what most producers in Canada are already doing to, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, different levels of, of uh, degree, which is not bothering the soil, not tilling the soil. Um, the soil, soil is actually a living organism. It is, there, in, a, in one teaspoon of soil, there is, there is more microorganisms than there are people on the planet. And that's in healthy soil. But when, when soil is actually, how's my time look? Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, when soil is, is um, disturbed or uh, exposed to the elements, it actually dies. So as we, are, we have sunlight coming onto exposed dirt, it actually kills the, the, uh, the microorganisms in that soil. So in nature, soil is never left exposed. It's either there's something growing in it, it's covered by debris, it's covered by something. It's kind of like this, you know, you, in your body, you want the skin to, to actually protect your body. So a covering on the soil is really important, not just to keep the carbon in, um, but to keep the life in, in, in the soil. And then, you know, a number of different uh, uh, of uh, regenerative activities, um, more plants, um, you know, uh, uh, the integration of livestock. Um, there's a number of, of, of things that we can, we can do to actually drive more carbon. We're starting the, the, to, to understand better some of the specific techniques but our focus is we won't really know what's actually working or not working unless we can accurately understand what's happening in the soil and, and do that more cheaply and, and more accurately. So our focus is how to quantify soil carbon accurately, economically, and reliably. Um, as I mentioned, our, we, you know, we use a combination of, of hardware and software machine learning tools to get more accurate measurement. Karen mentioned the signal to noise ratio. It's really, this, you know, it's, it may be a technical issue, but this is really at the core of what we're, we're doing, driving down that signal to noise ratio. Right now, there is a huge amount of variability in soil sampling around carbon. So if you actually want to see if what you're doing is working from one year to the next, it's hard to really understand whether those activities are really working because there's so much variability. It's kind of like investing into a, a stock market and saying, okay, you put this much money for a million dollars into the stock market for a million shares and uh, the, T, the, the TSX says, no problem. I got your million shares plus or minus 40%. What are you gonna, you know, how much are you gonna actually pay for, for, for that if there's that much variability? So we gotta get the accuracy easy, uh, much higher and, uh, and, and, and do it more, uh, more frequently and at a cheaper cost, not only so that we can get confidence in carbon markets, but so that you get confidence in what's actually happening and what you're doing uh, is, is actually affecting what's going on the farm. 
So that's number one. Predictive modeling is, is, uh, is another piece of that. So how do we get that cost, that variability down? And how do we get the accuracy across your field? Right now, a lot of the, the uh, soil sampling is done based on um, you know, the topography or random sampling. So we've, you know, we've got a tool that uh, uh, allows sampling right away now to be able to be much more accurate in saying, how do you take the samples from from a place that uh, will give you much more information. So um, what you'll hear here in, in the years ahead, um, starting this year and next year, uh, we have tools that are deployed across Canada right now. They will be, they're in the alpha stage. Um, so if you're interested in, in trying these out, they're available this summer um, and more, and commercially available next year. Much better soil sampling. So how do we collect samples down to a meter, get, Everything that you're need, you want right now that you're, you're doing soil sampling for, NPK, moisture temperature, EC, pH, but also get carbon. One thing I want to I want to leave you with is you're going to hear about carbon, and carbon isn't just one thing. Carbon is found in many forms. So these this uh, term at the bottom, POM and MOM, you're going to hear this probably more over those the, the years ahead. Carbon as it's as it's drawn into the, to, to the soil, um, first is stored as organic carbon. So POM is, stands for particular organic matter or also known as organic carbon. This is the kind of carbon that, that moves. It'll, it'll, um, uh, it's also very important, um, but it's less stable. There's an, another form of carbon that's called mineral associated organic matter. This is very stable carbon. It's not measured very easily right now and as we start understanding how much mineral associated organic matter is in there, that actually helps to, to provide some confidence to carbon markets around how permanent the carbon is and also gives you uh, a lot more information about what's going on. So one of the things I'm really proud of and, and happy with our, our discussions and partnerships with the, the Federation um, has been this focus on outcomes based. We need to move agriculture to outcomes-based rather than talking about uh, having governments, uh, you know, impose certain processes that, um, that may or may not be uh, effective. If we can really focus on outcomes, um, that will really enable us to, to, to build to a more economic, much more efficient um, form of agriculture. And, we're, uh, and, and our focus is to continue to work with you uh, on doing that. One of the key things is going to be the user experience. As we come up with these new technologies, it's not enough to just have a tool that measures carbon better. It has to be usable for, for the producer as well. And that's something that uh, um, we're working hard on and we would we'd love to, to, if any of you are interested in working together with us to give feedback on the tools that are coming up and how they can be more usable, usable to you in your operations, uh, we'd love to work with you. Okay. So again, a great couple of presentations, and if anyone has questions, please make your way up to the mic. Um, are you coming for a question, Jen? Or take it away. There's not a big lineup, so I'm going to ask two. One is to Karn, and that is, can you speak to uh, collaborations that you've done with existing groups like the Certified Crop Advisors? Is this something where you're working within existing networks where we have people doing on-farm trials uh, to be able to kind of help make sure that this is something that's adaptable to our on-the-ground technologies? Yeah. It's, it's a great question. Um, so this is pretty cutting-edge technology. Um, um, as I was mentioning before, as a, as a company, we've worked together with with uh, uh, um, with with the FCA, but um, you know uh, we haven't been super public ar around this um, just because of, of patents. We have about mm -hmm. 260 patents as a, as a company. That will that's changing now. We have been um, working with um, producers um, on thousands of acres across uh, across Canada. Um, and we'll we, we, we work together with universities, the University of British Columbia, University of Saskatchewan, UPEI, a number of different universities across Canada, um, and we'll, we'll build on that, those partners more. But um, yep, this is a great time to, to, to start building partnerships if there's, there's ones that 
that's great. And I'm glad to hear that you're talking about like working with universities. So my next question is for Karen. You talked about the Sentinel plots, and that makes a lot of sense. Are you already working with universities and and um, stations like Living Labs Initiative to kind of use this tied in with researchers, or are you looking more for uh, private firms to be able to do something like this? Thanks for your question, Jen. Um, so we spent, with some money from Alberta Innovate, uh, over the course of 2020, developing a soil carbon roadmap strategy. Um, and we engaged a variety of academic institutions, uh, the researchers from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, you know, to, to say, okay, it, it mostly it's focusing on grasslands carbon because we don't understand how soil organic carbon changes with different management systems in grasslands. We don't report that in our national emissions inventory. So we focused a lot on how do we build a system, an estimation system um, that would connect with existing research plots. We mined old data that hadn't been published and the researchers were great at bringing forward. So we have a whole network of sites um, and this was work done with CFGA as well. Um, and so the strategy is there and it's, it's ready to move forward, but we don't have a, a, a host. Um, I do know that uh, in our working with Environment Canada and Climate Change, um, Natural Climate Solutions Group, and the Science and Technology Group within Environment Canada and Climate Change, they are altering the way we are accounting for soil organic carbon in our soils in Canada to be more of a carbon input based approach. So we're going to see changes in the way our inventory is accounting for carbon. And I'm hopeful that this whole sort of network idea of a, a carbon estimation system for Canada would be taken up and be funded by a collaboration between governments, perhaps foundations, but right now it's it's sort of sitting there. All the list of sites, all the data sets. Um, it would be great to build out a public data set for everybody to access what we've mined from, you know, the the researchers. Uh, but it's it it doesn't have a home right now, Jen. Yeah, that's a good start. Thank you. And, and Karen, just w one thing that we're hoping is there is a funding application for for a Canadian soil mapping uh, 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 fund, and hopefully that that can actually get funded, and um, um, and and we'll have that you know public access database um, in in the years ahead. That would be great, Karen. We did apply to the funding uh, Environment Canada Climate Change, but we didn't get funded. <laughs> So I'm going to be very unfair because I know it's almost impossible to have a short answer to, in this complex uh, subject matter, but I know that Jane's question is going to be very brief and to the point, and uh, uh, so fire away, Jane. So just really quickly, I'm just curious, are there national and, or international standards for equipment that measures the carbon uh, in the soil? I'm just curious as to how it's validated, like how the, the outputs are validated in terms of what the equipment registers. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, maybe Karen, do you want to, do you want to take this one? <laughs> it's hard when I'm not there, Karen. Um, so, so there is FAO has, you know, an MRV system for soil organic carbon. Um, there are sort of standards out there for the, the gold standard is of course, taking the soil core and getting the bulk density and a percent carbon and then getting the stock of carbon on a per, you know, a mass per area basis. Um, the, the Australian one that I mentioned does allow for handheld near infrared uh, devices to be used. So those can be taken out to the field. So they do, but you have to build the spectral libraries and the training databases as Karn was talking about using the artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to train the databases. You still need to, I think, to do that, that that ground truth thing of soil sampling, but that once you get it calibrated, then you can move forward without the intensive soil sampling. This is pre-commercial. I just wanna make clear, it's pre-commercial. So we're seeing some systems accepting these alternatives given there's criteria in place. Yeah, 
So the, the, as, as Karen was mentioning, the gold standard right now is you take a soil core and you send it out to a lab. The, there's a whole bunch of problems with it, not, not the least, which is that's really expensive to do, um, uh, to, to really monitor this um, well. Number two, just as a scientist, there is, you know, as you're taking these samples, there's still a lot of variability as you're going to send these to different labs. And we've done that ourselves. We've sent the same soil sample to 10 labs and had, you know, almost 10 different, you know, variations. It's, there's just a number of reasons for that because as you pull soil out, you know, it, it, it's, it's exposed now. Um, it's also, there, there's just a number of reasons for that variability. So what we're trying to do is we've actually got sensors that will go down, down to a meter and get a soil reading um, within, well, it's, it takes about 15 seconds and uh, you get a soil reading in a minute. As Karen mentioned, it's not ready for uh, commercial yet this year, but we're hoping for it to be next year. It will be, uh, but we do have folks that will come and do it on farm for you um, uh, this year, if that's, that's of interest. But th this is a whole evolving area to, to, to be able to get much more accurate, reliable data uh, in soil. It's, it's the key thing that's been missing for about 40 years. This is why we haven't been talking about it enough, because there isn't um, um, that degree of confidence yet. And I think for Australia, I mentioned their one of soil organic carbon is one of their pillars in their technology strategy. They put a call out saying we want to get it $35 per hectare down to $3 per hectare is their goal. And so they're investing a lot. You're seeing a lot of innovation come out of Australia. Thank you. And there will be out of Canada too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fa fascinating discussion and, and certainly, you know, when it comes to the technology uh, aspect of it, I, I know my kids' generation is much more confident and comfortable in using that, that technology, but, you know, getting it on farm where we all have the confidence in using it is important, but, but also, you know, as Karen, as you, you will have experienced, you know, it's, it's the confidence uh, or reassurance of, of, of the data that we're getting that we have confidence in the modeling process so that it actually does reward what we're doing fairly. Uh, is, is really where we need to go. So thank you to both of you. That was an excellent, excellent session, and we appreciate uh, your input, and thanks for the questions as well. So our, our final panel today will we'll now kind of get into the nuts and the bolts, the ROI, for, if, if you will. And we're going to look at a couple of different approaches to how we actually award farmers uh, credits for emission reduction activities, whether it's voluntary or whether it's compliance, because there will be both aspects of that as we go forward. So we'll be contrasting compliance credits under Canada's carbon offset system uh, with voluntary credits from uh, a leading uh, private carbon credit program. So our first printer, presenter in this session is Judy Meltzer, and Judy is the Director General of the Carbon Pricing Bureau for Environment and Climate Change Canada. She's currently working with the provinces, the territories, and other major stakeholders to implement protocols to generate credits under the federal carbon offset system. Judy will address how the upcoming federal carbon offset credit system will reward farmers for emission reduction activities. So Judy, if you're all set to go, uh, take it away, and uh, please I'll again remind you, eight minutes is your time limit. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate um, being able to participate in this panel, and I'm sorry not to be there in person. And uh, I just want to confirm that you can see uh, my, uh, my slide uh, on screen and hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you good. Okay, that's great. I realize that we're a little bit pressed for time. So um, I'm going to um, give just a brief overview of where we're at in the development of the federal GHG offset system, including with regard to the protocols that are relevant to the uh, agriculture sector. Um, and, uh, and then time permitting, maybe speak briefly a little bit to the difference between um, the public versus private, or as we think of it, sort of the compliance regulatory types of offset, offset systems versus uh, voluntary. So just moving to the second slide, I know that somebody at your end is, is moving the French, so I'll, I'll flag it when I'm moving. Um, so I think a lot of folks are familiar, we've, we've discussed the, the development of the federal GHG offset system before, um, but it, it basically will create an incentive for cost-effective uh, reductions in Canada from voluntary activities that are not covered by legal requirements or by carbon pricing. 
And so offset projects, in order to be able to uh, be credited, they must be additional and go beyond business as usual practices or what is uh, you know, required by uh, legally or other regulations, for example. And ideally, these will allow um, farmers, foresters, Indigenous groups, other project developers to earn revenue for GHG reductions or removals, and thereby helping uh, stimulate innovation and private sector investment. One point to note is that in order to receive a federal GHG offset credit under our system, projects must generate Judy, reductions. Judy, can I just yeah. interrupt you? Can, can you switch sure. your screen to presenter uh, mode? Oh, sure. I think. Thanks. Um, well, let's start. Apologies. Just having some technical. Is that better? Can you see it any better? It's not sort of freezing on me as I go to switch it. I apologize. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's better. Okay, and I'm happy to circulate this after. Sorry for that. Um, so to receive a credit, um, projects must um, be um, real um, and the reductions that are generated must be able to be measurable, quantifiable, unique, um, so not credited elsewhere. Um, verifiable, and of course, permanent. And the federal offset system, like other provincial offset systems, is an example of a public or compliance-based um, regulated offset system. So its primary purpose, the reason we initially um, uh, began to develop this, is to create offset credits that can be used for compliance by regulated parties. In this case, regulated parties under the federal carbon pricing system for heavy industry. Um, however, I should note that we do expect there will be other sources of demand for these credits, so there's no limit on how they can be uh, used and who can purchase them. Um, and those sources of demand may come from other initiatives such as green government goals um, or private uh, corporate emissions reduction targets. Um, and for uh, major projects, for example, undergoing impact assessment um, or by other, other programs and other levels of government. As a compliance-based system, though, because federal offset credits can be used to comply with regulated reduction requirements, in this case for industry, it means there needs to be a very high level of assurance that the reduction is additional, real, quantified, and permanent, et cetera. So this is, uh, I think, um, something that's important to note um, for compliance-based systems because they have to be able to substitute uh, from a reduction that's made by a regulated party. So just moving on to the next slide, um, just briefly. Um, so the, the federal offset system includes three main elements. So one are the regulations, um, and these will implement um, the, the broad operational aspects of the system. And we published draft regulations um, in March of 2021, and we're working hard to finalize these regulations um, targeted for uh, later this spring, so by mid-2022. Um, we're also in parallel developing sort of the infrastructure to support it through a registration and credit tracking system. And maybe most relevant for the discussion today, um, we're also in parallel developing protocols. And these will be outside of the regulation, but we'll develop them in parallel on an evergreen ongoing basis. And these set out the approaches for quantifying um, reductions and removals for um, given uh, project types. So each specific offset project type will have its own protocol. Um, our aim is really to develop flexible, implementable protocols. We've certainly heard that message clearly, but we also need to ensure that these are robust and in line with the requirements of the offset system. So um, we've initiated the first uh, tranche of protocol development. We initiated that last spring. Um, and we are relying heavily and uh, on um, uh, consultation and making sure that we involve external experts, uh, technical experts, sector experts, and stakeholders as we develop these protocols. We want to ensure, and I think Karen and Carmen and others have made this point, we want to ensure that the protocols take into account the most up-to-date science, emerging technologies um, related to specific project types. 
Um, we're also uh, consulting with other government departments, including um, uh, AAFC, as well as provinces, territories, and Indigenous groups. And we're also, of course, leveraging um, lessons learned from experiences in existing offset programs. Um, we will publish each draft protocol for public comment as well, because we really want to make sure there's a really um, meaningful consultation on each of these. Um, I'm going to turn briefly just to the two protocols that were uh, we've initiated for development um, in the agriculture sector. So I'm going to move to the next slide. So I, I think, um, you know, we've been really clear. We really recognize the significant contribution of the sector in, in reducing emissions and, um, you know, in also advancing, um, you know, important innovations and technologies to reduce emissions. And the inclusion of the agriculture sector in the federal carbon offset system remains a priority for our department and the government. So the two protocols that we're developing um, in our first phase um, for the sector, um, uh, one is enhanced soil organic carbon. Um, and this, of course, as was referenced, I won't go into details in part because we're at the early stages of development, but of course this will credit sequestration of soil organic carbon um, and uh, the reductions and removals that result from the adoption of sustainable land management practices and activities that go beyond business as usual um, uh, to, to uh, lead to further reductions and removals. Um, where we are still at the early stage of developing this, um, as mentioned, we're, um, we're consulting with a wide range of stakeholders and experts. And so we haven't yet um, determined which specific practices will be eligible for generating credits that will be to come. Um, and it'll be established as part of the consultation pro process. Um, I think both Karen and Karen noted that this is actually quite a challenging and complex protocol to develop relative to some of the others. Um, and it will be informed through that consultation process. Um, we're, we're, we're hoping to have a draft protocol um, for this by mid-2023. If we can do so sooner, then we will, but that's, that's, uh, that's what we're aiming for right now, taking into account this is, um, there are a lot of complexities to this one, but we, we recognize there's, uh, it'll be an important incentive and, and we're excited about, um, about developing it. I think um, the one thing I would note, and I think uh, Karen mentioned this, we we also recognize as we develop these that allowing for project aggregation, so trying to find ways to streamline and lower costs, so that for to enable participation um, uh, in the offset credit market and to try and minimize um, administrative burden where we can, is also something that we're going to continue to prioritize as we develop these. Um, the second, uh, and I'll try and uh, wrap up pretty quickly here, um, just uh, mindful of the time, but the second one that we're looking at is uh, livestock feed management. And, if, and this will, um, as was referenced earlier, will uh, credit reductions from changes to feeding practices to reduce methane uh, from cattle. It's also at an early stage of development, uh, so we'll have to come back to you with further details. Um, but um, this one, um, we're also hoping to have a draft protocol um, by um, mid to early 2023. We expect, again, um, we'll, we'll have to come back and confirm timelines as we consult on this, but we expect that this one will be able to be finalized um, on uh, sooner than, than ESOC. Um, it's uh, relatively, uh, maybe a little bit less complex to develop. So uh, maybe just, why don't I pause there? I was going to just speak briefly to uh, compliance-based sort of public versus private, but in order to ensure that Alistair has sufficient time, um, why don't I leave it there and happy to provide some follow-up um, information and, and questions, uh, time permitting. Again, we're, um, we're really excited to be developing these and really look forward to ongoing um, consultation, including with the CFA membership. So thanks for, for the time to present today. Great. Thanks very much, Judy. And, you know, we often joke that uh, in agriculture, profit seems to be a dirty word. And I think we actually need to apply that concept to the term protocol. It doesn't have to be a dirty word. It can, you know, we can use it to our advantage and, and, and really drive the green economy and, and, and drive profitability through our farms. So, so thanks for that. And we look forward to working with ECCC going forward on those protocols. So next up, uh, again, uh, probably a very familiar face uh, to a lot of you in, in the room here. Uh, Alistair Hanley is the founder of Radical Group Incorporated, and I think I, uh, Alistair and I probably went through his whole presentation last night in our, in our conversation, but uh, uh, certainly his 
His personal mission is to implement environmental market frameworks that stimulate green innovation and employment opportunities. Uh, and he's here to address the success of the private approach in helping us farmers reduce our emissions, and in particular with credits in the row cropping and, and protein sectors. So, uh, Alistair, take it away, and uh, again, eight minutes. You told me I had two hours last night. <laughs> you did take two hours last night. Oh, it is so good to be in front of really people, real people, right? I don't have to ask if you can hear me or not. Uh, Alistair Hanley, uh, really happy to be here. Um, happy to be anywhere outside of Calgary these days. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive right in. I, I, I thanks to everyone who spoke to me last night and had questions about voluntary markets. Um, you can read up all about Radical online. I'm not going to tell you much about the company at all, uh, except the name harkens back to agriculture because we named the company after the first growth that emerges from a seed which Charles Darwin called the brain of the seed because it takes in information from its environment and figures out the most optimal place to be for success and that's the genesis of the name of Radical. Uh, but today I shouldn't look at the French slide um, and I'm gonna skip this slide. Oh I should look down here. I'm gonna skip this slide altogether. So market forces. Let's talk about market forces. I want to give you information today that you can walk away with and apply. Um, Karen talked about three types of markets. Compliance, compliance market, voluntary market, and insetting. And these markets, these boundaries between these markets is becoming blurred and in some instances disappearing altogether. And when you think about sort of markets and how they grow, we, we have this initial start and we have divergence in the market and we're kind of past that stage globally and we're in the stage of emergence where there are literally hundreds if not thousands of activities going on around carbon markets around the world to create these markets. And we have voluntary markets, we have markets for aviation, we have markets now that are emerging in between countries and as a result of this, we're getting overwhelmed with potentially new standards. We have opportunities for voluntary carbon markets or carbon credits to become compliance credits. A compliance credit that a country would use. We have countries around the world right now or in various parts of the world that are talking about nationalizing carbon credits, right? Effectively taking control of those. So all of these market forces are at play. And whether we like it or not, they have the potential to impact what's going on in Canada. So the growth around the agricultural focus on carbon credits is significant. And you really don't need to read this slide. This slide just lists some of the agricultural protocols that exist today in various parts of the world. On the left side of the screen, we have the gold standard climate action reserve. Karen spoke about these. These are voluntary markets. And there's protocols that exist for manure management, there's some protocols around feed, there's protocols around soil carbon, there's protocols that are trying to impact or trying to apply across the production of food. On the right side of the screen we have the Australia protocols. And you notice that Australia's got a significant number of protocols that exist for the agricultural sector including their soil carbon program, but they have programs for what they call human-induced regeneration, where large station holders are encouraged to modify the, their, uh, or manage their cattle more effectively, or feral animals to let the forest tree grow. And these protocols, some of them are generating massive amounts of credits. And when we look down in the corner, we have Canada, right, and so I, I, I made a mistake, I only put the soil enhancement protocol in, on that slide, I, I, so I apologize to Judy for not putting on the, uh, the improved feed management as well. But these are two protocols emerging for the compliance market in Canada. In Alberta, we've had two compliance protocols. One is a nitrogen em emission reduction protocol. It's been in place forever, but it hasn't generated a credit yet. Right, and the reason why is because it's not really economically viable. So when we talk about protocol development, not only do we need to think about the science behind the protocol, but we need to determine whether or not that protocol is economically viable because farmers are business people and businesses typically do things for one of three reasons. Increase revenues, lower costs, mitigate risk. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're a farmer or whether you're a big polluter, these are the things that apply and we need to view action around emission reductions, I think, through those lenses. Because it helps inform policymakers on activities that we can embrace to reduce emissions and create credits. And then, the last piece, and the piece I sort of want to focus on, and I'm going to shut up really soon so we can get to questions, is what I would call an emerging voluntary market in Canada. And you may have uh, noticed or heard uh, Farmer's Edge recently uh, generated 30,000 carbon credits for farmers, mainly in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, using a modified version of Alberta's conservation cropping protocol, and they put that on the Canadian Standards as Registry. And this is what I call this nascent voluntary market. So kudos to them for, for getting out there and doing that. But there's more action coming. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Lots of companies, over 240 companies in the U.S. and Canada, trying to develop carbon credits. Millions of dollars spent by the USDA. Lots of activity in the space. We'll skip this slide. Let's go to this slide. So, all this activity in the space, we've got this emerging voluntary market in Canada, we've got the federal government working on compliance market, we've got provinces trying to do this, and people are ham starting to hammer on farmers' doors going, sign up for my carbon credit program. Now, radicals developed about 31% of all of the agricultural credits generated in Alberta. Right, we've been doing this for a long time. And when we looked at this, this nascent voluntary market, we stepped back and said, wow, did we, did we step in? You know, did we take the 3,000 clients that we've got in Alberta and did we look at rolling them into the voluntary market? What about the federal market? So our decision was simply to slow down. Just to slow down. And I'll tell you why. Carbon markets aren't likely to go away anytime soon, right? We're seeing massive price appreciation, especially in the voluntary market, where in the last 18 months, some prices have gone up 1,000% for voluntary credits, right? There's so many groups working on protocols, right, for the voluntary market for the agricultural sector, and these protocols, as they become more effective and more economically viable, we're going to see winners and we're going to see losers, right? If you wait for the federal government program, you're potentially going to generate higher revenues for your credits, right? So we decided to wait and get a bit of clarity, knowing that opportunities are going to abound. But ultimately, right, it's your farm. You get to decide whether you want to participate in a market today or, or whether you want to wait. So if you want to start today, and one of the questions I had from someone last night is, how do I know if the person that I'm dealing with is, is legit? So if you're thinking about diving into the voluntary market, uh, here's some things to consider. So if someone knocked on my door and said, look, man, we have got this phenomenal voluntary carbon credit program. It's going to be massive. Here's the questions I'm asked. What's the price for voluntary carbon credits today? Do you have a buyer for them? Right? Do you actually have someone who's going to buy my carbon credits? And have you confirmed right? or, or, or what happens if you generate more credits than you can sell? Right? If there's 5,000 farmers in your program and you can only sell half the credits, what do I get? Right? Uh, what's the term of my contract? Are you making me sign a 10-year contract? What are my obligations under that contract? Can I, can I, can I work the lands? If, I, if, I, if my soil's compacted or something happens to my cattle, do, do, is there risks, right? Um, how many other voluntary credits have you generated and sold? That's a pretty good question to ask as well. And then, if you generate voluntary credits, whether it's for protein production or carbohydrate production, um, can I use them in the global voluntary market or can I use them in a Canadian compliance market, right? And then the last one, will participating in your program prohibit me from participating in a federal market 
or an international market? These are the sorts of questions that I think producers need to be reflecting on and asking. Because the answers to those questions are going to really give you some of the, the, the information that you need to decide which way that you want to go. So with that, I'm done. I'm going to be around for a few hours, happy to have talk inside or outside. Well, we shouldn't talk inside when Keith is talking, but um, we'll just, <laughs> we want to, um, but let's just go for questions. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alistair. And I don't see anybody at the mic right now. We're extremely tight on time, but I am going to ask one quick question of both of you. One of the things that farmers who belong to farm organizations hear consistently from their membership is burdensome paperwork. So as we go down the road of developing protocols and actually getting into the carbon credit game, um, what, what can farmers expect from an administrative aspect? Is, is it going to be cumbersome? Is it going to be burdensome? Or is it just a necessary evil that we have to do? And I'll get you both to answer quickly, and then I will go to Ron quickly afterwards. Go ahead, Judy. Thanks very much, Elster, and, and for that question. It's a really good question, and it's a really important one. The question of, I mean, it speaks to the points that Alistair was raising about, you know, what uh, a farmer is going to weigh in terms of deciding to choose to participate in an offset program, whether it's federal or other. And so what we have, um, you know, tried to signal and will continue to focus on this is how can we make sure that um, we are developing these protocols um, in a way that, um, you know, are as administratively streamlined you know implementable as possible um, but yet still meet the the tests the the bar which is um, that sort of environmental robustness and the assurance that they're additional and going to be permanent and things we can actually you know measure and count so so I think it's a balance but one of the things and I think I mentioned this um, you know aggregation is going to be a big part of that that will be um, the ability to aggregate across uh, projects um, will definitely help lower costs so those are the kind of things we're thinking about as we develop these um, one of the reasons I mean this will be I think a key part of consultation we need to hear from stakeholders from people who plan to implement these projects you know what um, how we can better uh, you know streamline the administrative aspects so I think it's it's a really important question and something that we'll have to work on and and um, and and may vary across you know protocol types as well I, I think when it comes to paperwork the real question is is the effort worth the reward it's as simple as that and I added it I'll just tell a quick story and I'll put it into perspective. Years ago when we, carbon prices were really low in, Cal, in Alberta, a farmer called me up and says, I got my carbon check and I thought, this is going to be a good call. And then he said, I want out of your program. And I said, well, how come? Well, it's not enough money. And he had a small farm. So I said, well, how much money did you get? I'll see if we did it right. And he said, we got $1,000. So I said, okay. I says, uh, how long did it take you to fill out those forms we sent? And he said, oh, a couple hours. I says, well, let's call it three hours. So you're making about 350 bucks an hour for your time, which is probably what your lawyer call charges you. Anyways, I'm taking you out of the program right now. And he's like, whoa, 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 right? So when we think about return per acre, right, or per cow, per liter of milk, per whatever, that return can be very, very low. When we look at the return per hour, it can be thousands of dollars per hour. So paperwork, horrible thing. None of us like it. Measure it by whether or not your time is worth the money you're going to get from it. But it is required. Ron, go ahead, quick. Yeah, just a quick question for uh, Judy um, on the protocols that are being developed and specifically the livestock feeding protocols. And I know a lot of research has been done on feeding protocols to reduce methane production. But the other side is genetic improvement, and both from productivity and there's research being done that shows that genetic selection might produce animals that have produced less methane. And I guess the quick question is, has there been any consideration uh, given to looking at genetic improvement as something that would be measurable to improve the methane emissions from livestock? 
Thanks for that question. And it's something I'm going to take away um, because we're, we're still too, at, at an early stage. Um, but uh, but I appreciate having that, that uh, put on my radar. And it's certainly on, you know, I think there's different technologies and practices that we still haven't determined which ones will be eligible for credits. Um, but that one is certainly there's an awareness and it's certainly something um, that we'll look at through the consultation process. But it's too early to uh, to be able to confirm whether that would be part of it. But appreciate the point and look forward to follow up. Am I getting kicked off You're getting now? kicked off, yeah, but thank well, you. Well, thanks, and if you're disappointed, just blame him, so thanks. <laughs> well, they'd have to get in line for that. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks, Judy and Alistair, and to all our presenters, and, and um, you know, Judy, I know we, we're starting to have some good conversations with your department, and look forward to it, and in case you need to know it, 613-236-3633 is our phone number. Uh, happy to take a call anytime. So.